let's be real. YouTube is all about entertainment. I used to think that feminism was a reasonable and rational ideology with redeeming factors and decent arguments. We all go through phases, particularly when we're young and have little experience in the practical world. It's a time of life when we think we have all the answers to life's great questions, and everyone that disagrees is wrong. Then I realized, feminism is cancer. Oh my, I guess this is when you discovered Milo Yiannopoulos, another passing phase, I guess. Women have the female privilege to be able to sit at home comfortably and raise children while men go out and break their backs to bring home the bacon. Does this apply to vegan households? But Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization created and funded by George Soros to victimize and destroy the black community. Why do people always use George Soros as the boogeyman? Just not fair. Black people are not victims. I've never been arrested. And you know why? It's because I know how to dress and I don't break the law. Is this parody or sarcasm? I can't tell. You are probably being deliberately simple here. You have to be. The real world that most of us inhabit, you know, the one with laws and says that anyone could be a victim. If you're straw manning the all lives matter or blue lives matter crowd, then you've missed the point. Anyone who is victimized is a victim. Sorry to have to break that news to you. There are only two genders. <sighs> wow, that felt so good to say. You're either a he or a she. There's nothing in between. And I can say this. I'm trans. While most of us respect anyone who chooses to identify as whatever they want to, the argument is that if you are born with either an XX or an XY sex chromosome, you will die with the very same chromosome set. You can call yourself whatever you want, no complaint from me, but remember that you can call a fish an elephant, but that fish will die as a fish. I got tired of holding on to a dogmatic ideology that not only did it move me forward, but more importantly, didn't make me money. Let's be real. YouTube is all about entertainment. I gather from Cat Black's rant about anti-feminists making money from making naughty videos about feminists that maybe she's a little jealous of the fame and fortune of some of the people she might be criticizing. Because let's face it, you don't create a Patreon page asking for money with the goal of financial security if you're not trying to make a living out of entertaining people. Let's be real. YouTube is all about entertainment. While we do not have access to the total amount pulled in from Kat's Patreon page, we do have accurate stats on a few of those meanie anti-feminists that apparently are more entertaining. Throughout the video, Kat does appear consumed by how much money people are making, without even once mentioning the countless people who do not do it for the cash and in some cases refuse to monetize their videos, even though people like Pat Condal has more than double the subscribers and millions of views could easily rake in some dough but he does it as a service to the community and there are good thoughtful people like Noel Plum who is quite the gentleman. Let's be real YouTube is all about entertainment and most people aren't entertained by a formal debate. This is probably a popularity contest for you Cat Black but I find a formal debate immensely entertaining. Being the most popular feminist on YouTube who took the red pill is a YouTube gold mine. When Lacey published her first video, it confused me in many ways, mostly because it was clearly for the same anti-feminist audience that has harassed her for years. Maybe she is a bit butthurt over the fact that Lacey Green is actually having serious and thoughtful debates with anti-feminists. As much as you hear anti-feminists talk about how reason and logic should rule these conversations on YouTube, hardly any of these videos exist, and they certainly aren't the most popular ones. Generally, these videos aren't full of research and evidence. It's mostly slurs, exaggerations, opinions, and chortling sarcastically at Jezebel articles. If you want to make a good impression on people and show that you use research and evidence, then a good place to start is with your own videos. Just flashing tweets and captures of articles across the screen does not qualify as research. I have watched your video all the way through, and the only thing I could find was your opinion, which is your major beef with the anti-feminist crowd. I invite everyone to watch Kat's video entirely. Links in the description and you decide. And these people make a lot of money. According to Social Blade, wrecked feminist videos makes between $700 and $11,000 a month, 
and they're mostly just compilation videos of young men screaming over women to wreck and destroy their feminism. And YouTube is just filled with content like this. I guess this does qualify as research and evidence. YouTube is just filled with content like this. You have created an ironclad case no lawyer would want to go up against. There's a lot of money in doing this, but the secret to being a popular anti-feminist blogger? Ooh, 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 I got this. Let me try to answer. The secret lies in the power of centuries of institutionalized cishet white male patriarchy. Am I right? I mean, they are to be blamed for all your failings, right? As being a minority. <laughs> Say what? It's not funny when you are confronted with people that you assume should be marching in lockstep with your cause of identity politics with a gentle mix of intersectionality thrown in that they disagree with you. They become traitors to the religion. These heretics have entered heterodox academy. They are now the enemy. You dare to disagree with a person of color? What? You are a person of color. Then you have to backtrack to simply you dare to disagree. Cat takes particular exception to Lacey Green having adult conversations with other people. This is not allowed in the feminist community. See how Kat forgets that she has serious disdain for those that create videos that are bereft of research and evidence and goes right into unsubstantiated attacks against nameless enemies. See how she employs the very tactics that she criticizes anti-feminists for using. Throughout the video, she shows a large degree of sympathy towards anti-feminists who have been misogynistic, racist, and transphobic, while framing feminist critiques as extreme because articles were removed and paid talks were being protested or canceled. And we get to the part where Kat uses absurd extremes to attempt to paint Lacey Green into a corner. And she can't seem to understand why trans people and people of color object to interacting with people who say and do racist and transphobic things. She insinuates over and over again that we don't interact with people who disagree with us. Apparently Milo Yiannopoulos and Richard Spencer are white supremacists just saying words. Is this when the new SJW and feminist buzz phrase comes in use? An argument to moderation? While I'm not aware of Lacey Green reaching out to the most extremes, Cat Black ineffectively attempts to poison the well by suggesting that Lacey can only debate white nationalists. It is because Cat Black is obviously a smart and talented person that I find this tactic particularly disappointing. Instead of chortling and smearing Lacey Green, maybe Cat can give us examples of the people in specific conversations that are so problematic. You know, that whole research and evidence she was talking about earlier. Hold yourself to those same standards, I say, Cat Black. These conversations aren't simple disagreements. They often have real-world repercussions. Words are often the first step to dehumanization, and historically, the last step is often violence and sometimes genocide. A cogent point, Kat. I don't think Lacey Green debating Blair White is going to directly lead to genocide, but this is where your argument against mature articulated discussion goes off the rails. You see, the best strategy to avoid war is negotiation. Many laughed at George W. Bush when he quipped, you're either with us or you're against us, heh <laughs> heh, or creating the axis of evil talk, even mistakenly calling the intervention in Iraq a crusade. He was full of bluster and did not want to have a dialogue with our enemies. Although this is not the best analogy since many believed he lied us into war, it has been historic wisdom passed down through the ages that peace negotiation often leads to the loss of many less lives than the hard-headed practice of saying you will never negotiate under any circumstances. I surely believe that some historic genocides could have been averted if there were people with the courage to want to work it out. I'm not being naive by saying this because I realize that both sides have to be willing to meet halfway and or compromise. The social justice warrior in feminist camp is on that very wrong side of history. Should you sit down for a spot of tea with Richard Spencer or Milo Yiannopoulos? Well, that's for you to decide, but there are many thoughtful people who just disagree with you. But to disagree with an SJW or, or feminist is to be racist, sexist, misogynist, and homophobe, and all the other phobias you want to throw in. Let's see the smear job you do for one of the famous YouTubers who dare to disagree. When people scream that there are only two genders, she isn't erased. When they say that they want a white ethno state, her place is still secure. So she can engage with it without ever really being concerned that it will ever really impact her. If this situation has taught me anything about Lacey and people like her, it's that they only care about minorities when they can monetize them, when they can hold them up as things that make them more unique and progressive. But when the money leaves, so does their support. You see, it's not a specific opinion that Lacey has voiced. It's not a stand that she has taken that offends. The mere fact that she is now questioning her once cherished 
beliefs that the heavy artillery is sent flying her way. If you have followed Lacey Green as I have off and on over the years, and as much as I disagree with her, it is a sad thing to hear this otherizing of Lacey that makes her out to be subhuman. This dishonest campaign to erase her accomplishments from history as if they never existed. Why? All because she stopped bowing and scraping before the high priestess of feminism. She is now a shunned apostate of the cult of SJW. Lacey Green recently published a video where she announces that she's going to be hosting live discussions and debates with anti-feminists on her YouTube channel. This sounds like a great idea on paper. I've always felt that discussions with people who disagree with you is a vital part of forming your own opinion. Yes, it sounds like a good idea on paper until you actually try it. Then it is no longer on paper. It becomes reality. Kat then brushes aside any notion of being able to negotiate with people you disagree with, citing no statistics, but that it just doesn't work. If it took me a hundred tries to convince someone to at least acknowledge my point of view, not even getting them to agree with me, I would consider that time well spent. You realize that getting someone who is opposed to you or even hostile to your position to empathize even a little bit is quite an accomplishment, but it takes a commitment and maturity that many lack. Like good old George W. Bush, the decider in chief, it's much easier to come to conclusions and see the world as us versus them. Being a feminist creator, I've accepted that my content probably won't be as successful as other people. And frankly, I'm okay with that. Money is nice, but I hate to live a life where I wasn't true to myself because it paid well. Although I've been critical of you for your unwarranted hostilities towards people who would attempt to discover why we disagree and possibly something more, I do commend your articulate setup on another video that you have recently made. A subject that I consider less frivolous and one that actually could one day involve genocide. Sexual violence and abuse are large enough issues to be addressed in the West. That's often tied to the fact that we have laws that are supposed to criminalize these things. And in Saudi Arabia, the patriarchal control of women is law. But does that mean that feminists in the West have nothing to discuss? Well, there's a flaw in that argument. This is Masal Khan, a Pakistani journalist student who recently was killed by his classmates for blasphemous content on social media. In Pakistan, it's a capital crime to insult the Prophet Muhammad. Though only about 65 people have been executed on blasphemy charges since 1990, dozens of people sit on death row right now, often because of simple accusations of blasphemy. I find that the same Western anti-feminists who use the what about women in Saudi Arabia argument against Western feminists are the same ones who consider things like being banned from Twitter or having their videos demonetized because of controversial content to be an affront to their freedom of speech. Blasphemy laws are laws, and often Sharia law, and they can be brutal and deadly. This is not to be confused with private censorship at universities or the terms of service agreements for online sites. If you can't see the difference, then there is no intelligent debate to be had. Now, I could argue that Western anti-feminists should be thankful that they aren't being killed for posting their controversial opinions online. No need to, you just did and it's a good point. But that would actually make anti-feminists the focus of a conversation that should be about the unethical nature of blasphemy laws that prematurely end the lives of free thinkers like Masal Khan. You are really missing the point here. The same people you criticize for objecting to the lack of rights women have in Saudi Arabia and other countries are actually the ones who raise concerns about those issues as well as blasphemy laws in Pakistan. They are also the very same ones that are arguing for your freedom to express your opinions here in the most open society on the globe. They are also the people who are part of this nation that has continually improved upon our own human rights. Sometimes the progress is slow, and it is not only manifest but also inexorable. You should have thought this one through. Sharia law is a human rights issue that affects millions of people around the world and is often enmeshed with the government of specific countries. You conflate blasphemy laws, notice I said laws, with private censorship. I can sum it up this way. We are grateful to have the protections in the West that ensure and affirm our rights and dignities as human beings. You rightly point to parts of the world where crimes that are punishable by death, torture or imprisonment, laws that you spell out quite specifically that are against the freedoms of women in Muslim countries is in marked contrast to the freedom and liberty that we enjoy in the United States and other civilized countries. The reason your poor comparison fails is because the very same system of Islamic patriarchy
patriarchy that enslaves women, imprisons or murders blasphemers, is the society where there are little or no freedoms for women, atheists, apostates, and even girls who want an education. Contrast that to the society that affords you the right to speak on any matter that you wish to without fear of retribution, imprisonment, or death. I do agree that just because something is rotten to the core in Islamic society, it does not in and of itself mean that everywhere else is better just because they are shitty. But we're not talking about everywhere else. We're talking about Western liberal democracies that have equality and liberty enshrined in their constitutions. In my opinion, Western feminists can absolutely do more to amplify the voices of Saudi women. Right now, Western feminists are embracing the same images of modesty and conservatism that reinforce the patriarchal systems that women like Dina suffer under. This is a good start. Having said that, you may want to have a chat with feminist Linda Sarzauer, who thinks these very repressive patriarchal laws are doing so much for women. Yes, Islam is the most feminist religion there is, according to Sarzauer. She wants to use the very symbol of female oppression to celebrate Sharia law in America. Remember that hijabs for freedom thing? Remember that feminist tweet she sent out? You do? That's good, because instead of running around and harshly judging the people who want to bring peace and understanding into the world, maybe you should start right on your front doorstep. I bear cat black no malice and I welcome a constructive discussion. I am a small channel, but am a person that admits when I have been wrong, so we are the type of people you should be talking to. Forget about the Spencers of the world. There are quite a few people that are capable of handling a two-way dialogue. There is never a guarantee of success, but there is always a try. If you never have a dream, you've never had a dream come true. Who said that? Thank you everyone for watching this channel. Please do take the time to hit the like and subscribe and hey, check us out on the social media sites listed in the links below. Goodbye. Goodbye.